know the tale about Fermat's last theorem. In 1637, Pierre de Fermat claimed to have the proof of his famous conjecture, but as the story goes, it was too large to write in the margin of his book. Yet even after Andrew Weil's proof more than 300 years later, we are still left wondering, what proof did Fermat have in mind? The mystery surrounding Fermat's last theorem may have to do with the way we understand prime numbers. You all know what prime numbers are. An integer greater than one is called prime if it has exactly two factors, one and itself. In other words, p is prime if whenever you write p as a product of two integers, then one of those integers turns out to be one. In fact, this definition works for negative integers too. We simply incorporate negative one. But the prime numbers satisfy another definition that maybe you haven't thought about. An integer p is prime if, whenever p divides a product of two integers, then p divides exactly one of those two integers. Let's call this definition b, and let's think about it. Does it sound plausible? Here's an example. Suppose our prime is 3, and notice that 3 divides 12, for instance. Now look at the different ways 12 can be factored as a product of two numbers. What do you see? No matter how we write 12, 3 always divides one of the two factors. You may think that's a silly observation, but it does not hold for composite or non-prime numbers. For example, 4 also divides 12, but 4 does not divide 2, nor does it divide 6. And the idea is that this observation will hold for all multiples of 3. For example, 3 also divides 30, and no matter how you write 30 as a product of two numbers, 3 will always divide one of the factors. Now, 6 also divides 30, but it does not have this property. In particular, 6 is not prime. So this new definition of prime is perfectly valid, even though it's not the one that we're so used to. So you might wonder, why don't we ever hear about definition B? Is it because these two definitions are actually conveying the same concept? In other words, is every integer that's prime in the sense of A also prime in the sense of B? And conversely, is every integer that's prime in the sense of B also prime in the sense of A? It turns out the answer is no, not always. That is, the answer is yes, if you're working with the integers. In fact, I encourage you to get out pen and paper, pause the video, and prove that an integer satisfies definition A if and only if it satisfies definition B. However, and here's where it gets interesting, if we replace the integers by a different number system, a system where we can still add and multiply and factor things just like we do with integers, but where those things aren't necessarily integers, then it is not always true that these two definitions coincide. To see why, let's look at an example. Let's replace the integers by a different number system. What exactly? Well, in Gabe's episode, Beyond the Golden Ratio, he explained how phi, the golden ratio, is just one of a family of metallic means. But the golden ratio also lives in a different family. Phi is the number 1 half plus 1 half times the square root of 5. But what about other numbers of the form a fraction plus a fraction times the square root of 5? There are infinitely many numbers of this form, and the golden ratio is just one of them. The set of these numbers form what's called a quadratic field, which plays an important role in algebraic number theory. But for the rest of the episode, let's just focus on the case when a and b are integers. Collectively, we'll denote these numbers by z adjoin square root of 5. Now the nice thing is that we can add and multiply these numbers together. For example, to add 1 plus 2 root 5 and negative 4 plus 3 root 5, just add the integer parts and the square root parts together. So their sum is negative 3 plus 5 root 5. And we can also multiply them together. We'll just use the familiar distributive law, which some folks like to call FOIL, so their product is 26 minus 5 root 5. Moreover, z adjoin root 5 also has prime numbers given by definitions a and b. But because we replace the integers with z adjoin root 5, we need to modify definition a a little. 
The reason is that Z adjoined root 5 may contain numbers that behave like the number 1, even though they aren't the number 1. I'll explain. Here's the new definition A. A number P in Z adjoined root 5 is prime if whenever you write P as a product of two numbers, then one of them is a unit. A unit is a word that means has a multiplicative inverse. That is, a number U is a unit if there exists some other number V so that U times V is 1. For example, in the usual integers, 3 is not a unit. It does not have a multiplicative inverse. Okay, yes, 3 times a third is equal to 1, but 1 third is not an integer, so that doesn't count. In fact, the only units in Z are 1 and negative 1, and that's why unit is a good generalization of the number 1. Okay, so we have two definitions, A and B. If we work with the integers, then these two definitions coincide. But now, I claim that because we are working in Z adjoined root 5, they do not coincide. In particular, the number 2 is prime by definition A, but not prime by definition B. First, let's see why 2 is not prime according to definition B. Notice that 4 can be written as 2 times 2, but it can also be written as 1 plus root 5 times negative 1 plus root 5. This means that 2 divides the product, but 2 does not divide either factor, 1 plus root 5 or negative 1 plus root 5. In other words, and you can verify, there are no integers a and b, so that 1 plus root 5 equals 2 times a plus b root 5. Similarly, if you replace 1 by negative 1. This shows that 2 is not prime according to definition b. However, it is prime by definition A. Why? I'll let you work that one out. It's a little trickier, but not too much. I recommend using a proof by contradiction, along with something called a norm. I won't go into the computations now, but if you're interested, check out the references below. All right, let's summarize. We have two definitions, A and B. When working with the integers, these definitions imply each other. But in Z adjoined root 5, they do not. Why? The reason is because the integers possess a very special property that Z adjoined root 5 does not have. Before I tell you what that property is, let me just say that this overall discussion is a part of something called ring theory, the study of rings, but not this kind of ring. A ring is a mathematical object, a set of elements that behave a lot like integers, even though they may not be integers and z adjoined root 5 is one such example. The neat thing is that once you have a ring, you have enough mathematical structure to talk about primality. In particular, our two definitions, a and b, have technical names in ring theory. An element in a ring is called irreducible if it satisfies definition a, and it's called prime if it satisfies definition b. So earlier, we saw that 2 is irreducible in z adjoined root 5, but it is not prime. Now here's the punchline. Primality and irreducibility will coincide if and only if your ring has a very special property. And the integers have that property. What is it? The fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Namely, that every integer has a unique factorization into a product of primes. More generally, if you're looking for a buzzword, the integers form a unique factorization domain, or UFD. And according to abstract ring theory, irreducible and prime are equivalent concepts if and only if your ring is a UFD, specifically if each element can be uniquely written as a product of irreducible elements. What's interesting is that not all rings are UFDs. And this brings us back to Fermat's last theorem. The absence of unique factorization is precisely why one of the many attempts to prove Fermat's last theorem wasn't successful. In 1847, French mathematician Gabriel Lemay thought he had proved Fermat's conjecture by factoring an expression like this, which occurred in the ring Z adjoined alpha, which is not a unique factorization domain, and so his technique didn't work. Fortunately, having a faulty proof isn't always a bad thing. 
In fact, the lack of unique factorization was spotted a few years earlier in a different setting by German mathematician Edward Kummer, who introduced what he called ideal numbers precisely to get around the issue. In short, the discovery that not all number systems or rings have an analog to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic set the stage for more than a century's worth of brand new mathematics, which then led to Andrew Weil's proof of Fermat's last theorem in 1993. So what proof did Fermat actually have in mind when he wrote in his margin? Well, I'm not a historian, but it's very possible that he assumed that properties of the integers, like unique factorization and the equivalence between prime and irreducible, will always hold, just like LeMay thought. But as we saw today, things aren't always what they seem. If you'd like to learn more about the ideas discussed in today's episode, be sure to check out the links below. See you next time. I'd like to start by thanking everyone who supports us on Patreon. Amounts big and small help keep the lights on here at PBS Infinite Series. We genuinely really rely on your support to help the program keep going, and we'd particularly like to thank Roman Pinchuk, who is our first Converse Level supporter. Extremely generous. I don't know what to say, but thanks. And now, let me get to some of your comments from our earlier episodes on the Peano axioms and the construction of the natural numbers using sets. First off, I want to shout out Robert Lowe from the UK, who we talked on Twitter, I believe he's a viewer, but um, he wrote a blog post about very similar information recently, the Peano axioms and the formulation of the natural numbers in sets and so forth. Uh, he and I had a chat about whether you should start the natural numbers at zero, which is a big controversy. Anyway, um, his blog is very good and the post is excellent. It's a good supplementary take on the material that we did here. The link to it is in the description. You should go check it out. Gerard Tan made the highly upvoted comment that for someone who was saying, let's not talk about numbers, I was numbering the axioms, one, two, three, and so forth. As many people pointed out in their replies to Gerard, those labels are arbitrary. I could have called them cheese, Cocoa Puffs, and Frankenstein, who cares? But point taken, touche. John Lang, or Lang, pointed out the similarity between the Peano axiom formulation of the naturals and the lambda calculus. And other people also mentioned explicitly the church numerals. The relationship between all this stuff is no coincidence. This is how the numbers can be formulated from an abstract computer science perspective as well. I encourage you guys to Google that stuff. Lambda calculus, church numerals. On a somewhat related note, Jesse Myers or Mace, pointed us toward the book Software Foundations by Pierce. Uh, I checked it out. Looks like it's a good resource. I added a link to the author's website down in the description of those earlier videos. Okay, a lot of you, including uh, Gianluca Basso, NR91, and Joey Bove Feistauer, hope that's pronounced right, uh, brought up that there are non-standard models of the natural numbers that can be extracted from the Peano axioms, at least in the standard first order logic formulation of the axioms. But as Andrew Keppert pointed out, the version of the axiom of induction that I gave is the second order logic formulation where you're quantifying over uh, sets and subsets and so forth. So for people who don't know the distinctions between first and second order and higher order logic, I assume that's the majority of the audience, don't worry about that conversation. But for the rest of you, the reason that I tried to sidestep this and why I made the disclaimer that I made in the second episode, which maybe I should have made earlier in the first episode, um, was because I wanted to make this as accessible as possible just to give people an introduction to these ideas without having to get hung up on the nuances of uh, first order versus second order logic formulations. So those are the reasons I made those choices and tried my best. Mebam or Mebame asked whether it's a good analogy to think of the von Neumann or Zermelo set theoretic constructions as an implementation, this is a computer analogy, and to think of the Peano axioms themselves as just an interface to the natural numbers. I think that's a great analogy. Craig Tile pointed out that in my little philosophical aside at the end of the second episode, that I probably should have referenced Paul Benassarat, the philosopher of math from Princeton who championed a structuralist view of mathematics. Uh, you're right, and this just goes to show how weak my philosophy foo has become that I'd forgotten about Benassarat, I haven't read him in over a decade, um, but you're right. I mean, these are not original ideas on my part. They've been championed elsewhere in the literature. Good call. Finally, David Giles said that Gabe should be given a million bucks to do this YouTube stuff full time. I agree. Now, I already get a huge pile of cash, which is why my clothes look so nice, but another million wouldn't hurt. So Elon Musk, you watching? Know what I'm saying?